Please be seated. Good afternoon. We call now the case of Medellin versus State of Texas, and we'll hear first from the petitioner. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Enrique Scherer, and along with my co-counsel, Michael Krauss, I represent the petitioner, Jose Ernesto Medellin. I will address the first question, whether the president has the authority to execute the ICJ's Avena judgment in state courts, and my co-counsel will address the second question, whether U.S. treaty law requires states to comply with Avena. With the court's permission, I would like to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. Yes, you may. Your Honors, in foreign affairs, we are but one people, one nation, one power, and this power is vested in the president as the sole organ of international diplomacy. In this case, the president seeks to execute a vena in state courts under his, as a matter of foreign policy, and that action should be upheld and given preemptive effect by this court by virtue of federal supremacy. And as I understand your brief, you're saying that that authority exists independent of the treaties. I mean, you're saying that the treaties support it, but that the president has this authority even without the treaties. Is that correct? Your Honor, that's correct. We believe that he has the independent constitutional authority to take this action by virtue of Article II of the Constitution. So he can put any matter that involves a foreign national or a foreign issue into or out of a state court as he thinks is in the best national interest? No, Your Honor, not necessarily. That is why we situate the President's action in this case within a context of shared institutional powers best articulated by Justice Jackson in his Youngstown concurrence. Because the President has uh, explicit or implicit congressional authorization in this case, then his, his hand is strengthened. He acts at, with his um, maximum authority, and that's the reason why we believe the President wins today. Now, if the President that were to act- That does depend on the treaties, then, on Congress's having um, approved these treaties, correct? Your Honor, to answer your question, no. The President could still act with his independent constitutional authority. Now, if he were to act with that independent constitutional authority in contravention of a constitutional principle or independent provision, then his, he would not be able to act. But in this case- But are you saying that he has either explicit or implicit authority from Congress to, uh, to act in this area where he's not plausibly enforcing a treaty? Your Honor, it would have to implicate foreign relations. So let's just imagine that Mexico is upset because so many of its nationals are being uh, uh, held in the United States and, and that there's no treaty involved. Could the uh, uh, President uh, do the same thing in order to resolve this uh, foreign policy conflict with a friendly nation? Your Honor, we believe that the President could in that case. What would be the explicit or implicit congressional author authority for doing that? Your Honor, the authority would derive from Article II of the Constitution. I, we were talking about congressional. Uh, you, you were talking about this being uh, in the number one category in Youngstown. Correct. Which requires congressional authorization. What would it be? Your Honor, in this case, we would be in Youngstown II, if that were the case. And there, if there were no congressional authorization, the president would have would to rely. Congressional silence. Right? Yes, Your Honor. And as Youngstown. So in order to get into Youngstown Category 1, then you have to be arguing that Congress has authorized this, and that depends upon it being an enforcement of the treaty. Correct, Your Honor. And so that if is. So we conclude in the second part of this uh, our argument that the treaty does not require enforcement, uh, then we are no longer in, in uh, the first category of Youngstown. Not necessarily, Your Honor. In this case, we argue that the UN Charter, which is U.S. Treaty Law, and the UN Participation Act, which is a federal statutory law, together put the President in charge of foreign relations with the United Nations. So he's entrusted with making UN-related foreign policy decisions. And remember, the ICJ is the judicial organ of the United Nations. Everything regarding the United Nations? No, Your Honor, because the President would still be limited in his actions uh, by the Constitution, independent provisions and principles. So he cannot just Her act. But in terms of the, in, of the uh, separation of powers issue, anything when guard, regarding the United Nations? Not, not if Congress has spoken, so if Your Honor. the General Assembly passes some uh, resolution on uh, environmental law or whatever, the President then has the authority to uh, preempt state law? 
No, Your Honor, and that's the, why we situate his power within Youngstown framework. If he were acting in the face of congressional disapproval, the Congress, his power would be at its lowest ebb, and you this court- You just told us that everything having to do with the United Nations, Congress has, has authorized him to act. No, Your Honor. What, what, what are the limits to your position? The limit, Your Honor, are the, the limits are congressional disapproval expressed in other statutes, none of which respondent is able to cite to, and also independent constitutional provisions and principles. Like what? Give me a constitutional principle that you think limits the ability of a president to put a case in or out of a state court if it involves a foreign national and a foreign policy concern. What provisions of the Constitution? Your Honor, I will give you a principle, uh, the principle of anti-commandeering expressed in Prince. If the, if the President were to say, I want the state executives to grant clemency, that would be acting in contravention to the authority he received well, from Congress. Well, in your papers, you said that there's no problem of commandeering because, after all, it's only the judiciary. Is that right? That's you correct, Your Honor. You don't think the judicial branch of a state government is a, a part of that state government and that you're commandeering it? Uh, no, Your Honor, I'm using the court's own language. This court held in Prince that courts should be treated distinctively in this regard because unlike legislatures and executive, courts apply the law of other sovereigns all the time. So this is a very narrowly cracked, crafted directive, Your Honor. What about Has it occurred to you at all that this really sounds sort of like a bill of attainder? That is to say, it's, the, it's, the, uh, uh, it's, the, uh, uh, it's a demand on a particular court to take a particular action in a given case? No, Your Honor, we don't believe that is the case. In fact, this court has upheld similar representations of foreign policy from the executive in other cases. In Ex parte Republic of Peru, the, this court enforced the State Department's request to grant immunity to a Peruvian vessel, and it was the State Department that had requested it, and because the State Department requested it, this court said that it was bound by that decision. It actually said that courts are, in, that courts are required to accept and follow the executive determination that the vessel is immune. Because but, it, it was but in this case, we're talking about reopening a final judgment, and doesn't and just as the anti-commandeering principle of, of Prince, you say, limits the president. Well, what about the uh, the, the principle of Plout versus Ben Thrift Farms that uh, that the political branches cannot reopen a uh, a, a final judicial judgment? Uh, Your Honor, we don't believe that that implicates it here because this has not been final in the eyes of the international court. That this, there's still an open question of whether there was an Vienna Convention violation, final, Your Honor. It's final in terms of United States law. Uh, Your Honor, it's still a question even within the United States because this court has to rule on this issue. And we believe that if you were to look at comparable principles like the Younger Abstention Doctrine, that's not implicated here either, Your Honor. In that case, plout means nothing because whenever the president decides to, uh, to reopen a settled judicial matter uh, and it goes to the Supreme Court, you can always say, well, it's not final yet because we haven't decided yet whether the president can reopen it. Your Honor, we believe that this is an ongoing litigation that uh, needs to be granted respect. But it's not ongoing. It's over. You're asking to reopen. No, Your Honor. It's over in the eyes of the state of Texas, but that is the problem in this case, Your Honor, that the president needs the authority to be able to say, look, this implicates our foreign policy. Could he, be, could he reopen a federal case? Your Honor, if there was a comparable situation in which... Uh, well, if someone had been prosecuted federally and had not gotten their consular rights... Are you saying that the president has the power to tell the judicial branch of the federal government that it has to reopen a case, even in light of Supreme Court decisions like Breard and uh, No, Your Honor. Uh, so, so in that he, case, he no. He couldn't do it to the federal judicial to a federal court. Uh, no, the reason, Your Honor, he couldn't do it in that case is because he would be asking a federal court to review a successive habeas petition involving a claim that was not originally raised at state trial, and that would go against the uh, congressional uh, uh, will in the anti-terrorism. I'm trying to understand the logic of your suggesting to us that the president's power, foreign policy power, is greater with respect to a state judiciary than the federal courts. Uh, Your Honor, 
the reason is because Congress has spoken on this matter, and I'm taking us back to the Youngstown category. That would place the President's actions in Youngstown 3, because Congress has said in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, federal courts cannot re-entertain these these cases. That is why the President's decision in this case is narrowly crafted. He directs his order to comply and discharge with, uh, of our international duties but to the, state but the, courts. But one, the, but one of the overriding principles of the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act is deference to the actions of state courts. And one of the primary ingredients of that deference is deference to state procedural rules as the state courts have applied them. Uh, Your Honor, that is one way of viewing it, but we believe that with the United Charter uh, Act and also with the UN Participation Act, as well as 22 U.S.C. Section 4802 that empowers the Secretary of State under the auspices of the President to protect foreign nationals in this country, and the Hostage Act, and which empowers... And what did the Secretary of State do in this case? The President's memorandum was addressed to the Attorney General. Correct, Your Honor, but this this so how power could you possibly be invoking the authority of the Secretary of State? Your Honor, what we're saying is we're taking this court back to its holding in Dames and Moore, where this court held that it was the general tenor of congressional legislation that gives implicit congressional tell, authorization. Tell us again, where is the congressional authorization? Your Honor, we argue that there's implicit authorization in the UN Charter. We argue... What are the words of the, sta of the statute you're invoking? Your Honor, the UN Charter specifies that if we do not comply with the decisions of the ICJ, then the United States will be confronted in the Security Council. The President has a vested so interest. So your argument is that even now that we have withdrawn from the optional protocol and no longer recognize the ICJ, if the next case will come out exactly the same way? Because it isn't pursuant to that, it's pursuant to something else. No, Your Honor. I'm arguing that because of the UN Treaty Law that we have... But that, that, that applies even if we withdraw from the optional protocol, as we have. And correct, Your Honor, that was a pre presidential decision so to that's withdraw. that's the President's authority, what you're saying is that, uh, is that he will be able to do this even for future cases. No, Your Honor. What I'm arguing is that the ultimate check ultimately resides with Congress, as this court held in Whitney versus Robertson. But only if Robertson. Congress enacts legislation to stop him. Under this court's analysis in uh, Dames and Moore, that would be one interpretation, Your Honor. Well, we have never confronted a situation where the executive has tried to dictate to a state how to proceed in a criminal matter, right? Correct, Your Honor. Right. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to tell us that this is controlled by our precedent. Um, you're saying that unless Congress passes legislation that stops him, the President of the United States can go into any state proceeding involving, involving a foreign national, and if he deems it in, a, in the interests of our foreign policy, tell the state whether to abandon statutes of limitations, reduce sentences, um, take a new look despite procedural defaults, he has that broad a power. Is that right? Your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I answer your question fully? I think that one. Your Honor, <laughs> Your Honor, no, that is not what we're saying, and I'm glad that you raised that question. We are arguing that the President, when he acts legitimately and does not act in contravention of another constitutional provision or principle, and he has some sort of implicit congressional authorization or congressional authorization gives implicit authorization, as, as the Youngstown holding, uh, Jack Jackson actually used the words that inertia, indifference, or quiescence gives implied consent, then the president has great leeway to act. And remember, this is a very narrow action. The president is narrowly enforcing this just in 51 cases. He's not rewriting Texas criminal procedure. Has it, has it occurred to you at all that your view of, uh, your sweeping view of the role of the president and of the, uh, of the uh, federal government in regard to foreign nationals, has it occurred to you that that, that concept, if applied uh, really no broadly than you've presented it to us, completely uh, uh, undermines the concept of sanctuary cities for, uh, uh, for uh, 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 undocumented uh, uh, foreign nationals? 
Your Honor, uh, we, have, we haven't considered the impact that it would have on sanctuary cities, but there are checks here, and that's what I'd like to stress once more, is that Congress could act or someone could also raise some sort of litigation saying, in this case, the president has violated this provision but, but of the Constitution. But you've essentially left nothing for the state and local governments in regard to matters that might be considered in some way international, which certainly uh, matters involving uh, uh, foreign nationals would, would be. No, Your Honor. Going back to my discussion about the uh, Prince anti-commandeering principle, if the, if the President were to say to the state of Texas, I want your governor to grant Medellin uh, executive clemency, that would be commandeering the executive and that would be improper. Just as if you were to say to the legislature, I want you to pass this law to teach uh, Mexican history for two years to improve our relations with Mexico. That would be commandeering of state legislatures, even but though it implicates okay to, foreign policy. To, to order reopening of final state court criminal judgments. Under the, principle, uh, under the principle expressed by this court in Prince, yes, Your Honor. And what? If they find prejudice, do what? Your Honor, in that case, it would be left to the court uh, of the state uh, of Texas. In fact, that's one of the things that recommends the president's action in this case, is that he doesn't implement Avena line by line. Well, the one thing they can't do is say there's prejudice, but you're too late, right? That is one interpretation, Your Honor. The president's memorandum... But inevitably, then, what they're going to be left with is they're going to either have to decide whether they're going to suppress some of the evidence and give him a retrial or vacate his conviction. Correct. At some point, that would be the logical response of the court. But the president gives the state of Texas maximum discretion, because all he says is, give effect to this decision, provide Medellin with review and reconsideration for actual prejudice. But he doesn't dictate how to resolve that case, the merits at least, and he doesn't even uh, tell them how to do it. He just says, do this. So he's being maximally respectful of state prerogatives here. I believe your time's expired and you've saved time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll hear now from the respondent. Your Honors, to put this case into perspective, the respondent has retreated into a separation of powers argument. We have argued here that within the Youngstown framework, the President is acting responsibly and within his constitutional and statutory authority. Now remember that within the Youngstown Where framework... Where on earth does the President get the authority to reopen state court judgments? Your Honor, that... I can, I can see that the treaty obligates him to do everything within his power is to enforce the ICJ judgment. But how does it conjure up new powers that the President has never had? Congress hasn't given them to him. The Constitution hasn't given it to them. He's never exercised them in the history of the United States. Your Honor, just as in Dames and Moore, where the Economic Powers Act and the Hostage Act did not give President Carter or President Reagan the authority to suspend claims against Iran, this is very similar. It's the general tenor of the legislation here that is, that's dispositive. The president has broad authority. This court in Garamond... It's a, but it's a long-standing aspect of foreign affairs authority for the executive to, to, to negotiate with respect to settlements of property disputes with other nations. It's happened over 80 times in our history. Names and more in that sense was... Uh, was completely unsurprising decision. Here, it's something that's never happened before. Your Honor, that's correct. Just like in Garamendi, it was something that had never happened before as well. And this case is actually more narrow than Belmont, Pink, Dames and Moore, and Garamendi. The How president is that? The executive is usually a litigant before courts, not someone who tells courts how they will administer justice. That's either done by the legislature through legislation or by superior courts through review. But the president never has that power to, to intrude into the judiciary in, in the way you're suggesting, to reopen cases? The president is doing nothing more, Your Honor, than executing a decision that runs from one court to another court. And what he is doing is very narrow. He's taking a very narrow action. Why does, a court, why does the president do that rather than the court? The victor is Mexico if it wants to come into the United States courts and argue that it has some right to get a United States state court re to reopen, it can do that. 
and this court or some other will decide it. Why does the president get to tell a state court that it must reopen the criminal proceeding? Your Honor, the president gets to do that because he has made a foreign policy decision in this case. And as this court has held in Curtis Wright and again in Belmont and Pink, the president is the sole organ of international diplomacy. He has the responsibility to live with the fallout of our foreign policy decisions. And thus, he should have the concomitant authority to make those decisions. And Texas- But, but in those cases, the, the court was considering how to decide a particular issue that had foreign policy ramifications, and it deferred to the president with respect to those ramifications. Here, there is no court that has the authority to reopen this matter, and I don't see how the president, it's not a matter of the president giving his views on how a court ought to decide a question that's within its jurisdiction. It's for the court, for the president to, to, to reopen a final judgment which no, which, which under Texas law simply cannot be done. Your Honor, my co-counsel will argue that the President and Congress acting together through U.S. treaty law have given this authority to the ICJ. And the President here is simply saying we will discharge our international obligations. Where, where has Congress given the ICJ the authority to interpret a treaty differently from the Supreme Court? Your Honor, that authority is not granted in the treaties, but what is granted is by the that's, the that's the net result of what the President is doing here, isn't it? In this group of 51 cases, the treaty would be applied contrary to how the Supreme Court, how we have concluded this treaty should be construed. Your Honor, I see that my time has expired. May I answer your question? You may. In this case, the President is doing something that's distinguishable from what occurred in Briard and from what occurred in Sanchez Yamas. And my co-counsel will elaborate in detail why they're distinguishable. But the short answer, Your Honor, is that Medellin is the subject matter of Avena, and thus he can use it as binding authority in this case, and that, that strengthens the President's hand, Your Honor. All right, anyway, with that segue, we will proceed to the second question. Thank you, Your Honor. 